I am so excited to be here with Dr. Richard Pitcairn and Dr. Wendy Jensen, who are the authors of New World Vet Veterinary Repertory. And as you can see, and I pulled up the Radar Opus webpage, that their repertory is on sale <laughs> through the end of the month. So if you want to purchase this repertory as an add-on, it would be a really good idea to do it this month since it is on sale. So I am going to allow Dr. Richard Pitcairn to take over. Um, thank you all for being here, and you can go when you're ready, Dr. Pitcairn. Okay. Um, so I'm moving over here. I assume you see that first first uh, slide, right? We do. Oh, excellent. So um, what um, Dr. Jensen and I are going to present our, um, our thinking and planning behind this development of a veterinary repertory. And we came to this from our experience. I, I've been doing homeopathy about 40 some years and Dr. Jensen, I think 30 some. And uh, so we, we acted from our experience trying to find the best way to prescribe accurately for animals. And uh, of course, that doesn't mean necessarily that we found the best way, but we, we used our knowledge as, as we could to try to come up with a, something that would help others as well. So I'm going to present first about the thinking behind it and why we chose the burning housing repertory as our foundation. And uh, then Dr. Jensen is going to follow with some examples and more detail about it. its use. So uh, what I want to do with the um, the veterinary repertory um, explanation is start out with, if, if you don't mind, start out with just the uh, context of, of why we have, why we need repertories. <laughs> because when we're going to get to the to the one we use, it, it has a particular um, orientation or a particular strategy. So we can ask, what is the purpose of a repertory? And uh, what I came up with is uh, to master a huge database of information and accessibility, finding the information more easily. And then I put in front door to Materia Medica. In other words, it's a way to find our way to what part of Materia Medica to, to study. So I want to talk a little bit more about the huge database. And um, because it's an incredible challenge that, that came to the homeopath, early homeopathic community um, when this information began to accumulate. Um, they didn't expect this, I don't think, I assume. Aconite, we're going to talk about aconite, aconitum, as, uh, as the remedy to focus here. And aconitum was used in herbal medicine prior to its proving for homeopathy. It grows in Europe, um, on the mountain slopes and east of the Himalayas. It was known as monk's hood, wolf's bane, leopard's bane, mouse bane, woman's bane, devil's helmet, <laughs> queen of poisons, or blue rocket, considered very poisonous. So I looked up what bane is, I didn't know. And the dictionary says it's defined as a cause of harm, ruin, or death. So uh, obviously they, they had a lot of concern about its dangers to them. Um, so let's look at first at how it was used as a, an herbal medicine. So this is an extract from the book I have on herbal medicine. Um, and the part where it talks about its use, preparation and use. And so it says in there that though aconite, it says in the hands of the intelligent physicians <laughs> is of great service, it should not be used in domestic practice. In other words, it's too dangerous to use. In improper doses, all preparations act as an energetic acro-narcotic poison as a sedative and anodyne. It's useful in all febrile and inflammatory, nervous, vascular, and muscular action. And then it lists some acute problems like rheumatism, pneumonia, peritonitis, gastritis, and so on. And it says especially is useful for the highest grades of fever and inflammation. Well, of course, this is what we found out 
from homeopathic study of it as well. And so that certainly uh, is ag agrees with that. Interestingly, the herbal dose they said in the book I have, it says the best preparation is the alcoholic extract formed by evaporating the tincture made of a pound of aconite into a quart of alcohol. And the dose is an eighth of a grain, the size of a seed of barley. <laughs> so you don't use one the size of a seed of barley, you use one eighth of the size of a seed of barley. I have no idea how they figured out that amount to give, but that's what they say to do. So that's, um, I looked up, I was just curious, I'll share with you. I didn't know what the word acronarcotic meant. I'd never heard of it before. I found it in a medical dictionary as an obsolete term for a poison or toxin that is either both an irritant and a sedative or causes dysfunction of an extremity or acral part. So of course I had to look up acral. <laughs> an acral part is relating to or affecting the peripheral parts, example, limbs, fingers, ears, etc. And uh, this is from the, the complete herbalist. Is a reference I use, complete herbalist. I think it's a reprint, it's 1993, but it's a reprint of a very old herbal book. Okay, so that's what they, that's how they viewed it in herbal medicine. So then, of course, in homeopathy, uh, the early testings that were done were of herbs like this because they were used in medicine. And so, of course, it was expected that it would likely be a useful medicine. So they would, begin to to do testing of herbs like aconitum but it was not i'm sure it was not expected how much additional information would come out of it i mean here you have this little herbal implication you know of how to use it and a paragraph or two and now what came out of the proving of aconitum was it resulted in 28 pages of symptoms and here is guiding symptoms and 33 pages in Allen's Encyclopedia, which is approximately over 1,700 lines of text of symptoms. Can you believe it? Would that blow you away or what? It's like, oh my gosh, I didn't know it was going to be that much. So let's look at this a little bit. Let's look at what provings are like, um, um, how extensive they can be. And so I'm going to take an extract from approving that's listed in uh, Richard Hughes book here. Uh, Richard Hughes book, Encyclopedia of Drug Pathogenesis. And um, <clears throat> this is from 1843. And uh, I know the text is small here, but we don't have to go through all of it. But this is just from the book. And it's approving by a Dr. Wurstel, who's 39 years old. And uh, it talks a little bit about his condition. And so he starts out with the first day here, um, the 22nd of February, he takes six drops and he has some slight symptoms. The next day he takes 12 drops and he has more symptoms and so on. Each day as he does it, the symptoms increase. Okay. So I'm going to, I just arbitrarily pick this paragraph down here for the, for the fourth day of of him taking it. I had not previewed this paragraph. I just said, oh, it looks good. I'll take it and see what I can do with it. So I took this paragraph and I, ex and I extracted, whoops. Sorry, something didn't here. So I extracted from it the symptoms from that paragraph. So they're listed here. I'm just, you know, take out the extra words. Uh, and so I don't know why it says day 17. I guess February 17th must have been. Actually, it was the fourth day of the proving. Um, so here's what he reported. Uh, in the forenoon, before noon, frequent vertigo. At noon, slight chilliness lasting till evening. Afternoon, a soft stool at night. Frequent waking without dreams and a chilly feeling with loose bowels and tickling in the anus for three days. That kind of bug you, wouldn't it? And then in addition, three vesicles appeared on the tip of his tongue, which burnt, had burning pain for four days. So the question then that, I, that comes up for me when I study these things is, 
if we had a patient with this pattern, could we find it in the repertory? In other words, are these proving symptoms actually in the repertory? Reasonable question, isn't it? So let's go to Kent's repertory and ask this question and see what we find. So the first one is um, this uh, vertical, vertical before noon. And I find a, I find a um, rubric in Kent's repertory here, vertical forenoon, there's 25 remedies, and aconite is in there. So yeah. that did appear in Kent's repertory. Then we go down to the next one here, <laughs> frequent vertigo, and we find vertical, there is uh, 277 remedies for this rubric in Kent's, and aconite is there. And it's present in the general rubric for vertigo, but there is no rubric for frequent or any similar words in Kent's. Then we come to the next one, slight chilliness at noon lasting till evening. Well, there's 128 remedies in the rubric for chilliness and aconite is there, but there's no rubric for slight or for starting at noon and extending to evening. And then we come to soft stool at night and there are 203 remedies in soft stool Aconites there, but there's no rubric for soft stool at night. Then again, looking at soft stool at night, the last line there, rectum urging desire at night, um, um, which is a similar rubric uh, to soft stool at night, but aconite is not in that rubric, and there is no subrubric for soft at night, interestingly. Uh, carrying on here, we've got fre frequent waking without dreams. Um, there is a rubric sleep waking frequent, 156 remedies aconite is in there, but there is no rubric for waking without dreams. Then there's tickling in anus. The, uh, uh, another prover that did this also reported as itching in the anus. So that was the word the other prover used. So we look up rectum itching as 153 remedies, aconite is there. Uh, aconite is present in rectum itching, but there's no rubric for anus tickling. And Kent cross-references from that word tickling to the rubric itching. Uh, vesicles on the tip of the tongue with burning. Um, aconite is in mouth vesicles on the tongue. However, it's, there is um, the, the rubric for vesicles on the tip of the tongue does not include aconitum. And then vesicles on the tip of the tongue with burning. Kent has mouth pain burning tongue tip with aconite, but there's no rubric for vesicles burning at the tip of the tongue. So that's interesting, isn't it, to see some of these are carried through, some are not. So I did, the, just as an exercise, I thought, oh, I'll just put in these symptoms from this paragraph into Kent's repertory and see if aconite comes up. Well, it does, as you see here. It comes up here in position 13, I guess it is. Yeah, position 13. So it does appear, but it's certainly not very prominent. Sulfur being, sulfur and lycopodium and nature mirror being higher indications. How about the newer repertories? Are they more uh, complete in the sense of including all the proving information? So here's the same exercise. Let's look at other repertories. So I have uh, Kent's repertory, the Bonehausen repertory that we're going to re talk more about, the complete 2018 and synthesis, the, what they call the treasure edition. Okay, so we look at the first symptom, vertical in the forenoon. Kent has it, um, Bodinghausen does not, um, the complete and synthesis have it, yes. But then we come down to these other symptoms that we were not, not able to find in Kent's, and they are not in any of the repertories, as we found it, not in Kent's, and they're not in the other ones too. Stool urging at night is not in any of the repertories. Waking frequently is in all of them, yes, but not from dreams. 
And then we come down to anus tickling. Uh, in the complete 2018, it's in the rectum formication and crawling, and it's also in rectum itching. In synthesis, it's in rectum tickling, re refers you to rectum itching, which contains echinacea. And then we come to um, anus itching. It's in um, all the first three repertories, but in synthesis, it's under rectum itching. They don't have anus itching. And in anus itching all day, it's not in any of the repertories. Uh, tongue vesicles with burning is in Kent's, not in Berninghausen. In the complete, it's in mouth eruptions, vesicles burning, but not under, but not, under mouth vesicles burning, but not tongue vesicles burning. It is in the synthesis. <coughs> and then vesicles tip of tongue is not in any of them. Tongue burning, it's in Ken and Berninghausen, not in complete or synthesis. Tongue burning tip, it's in Kent, but not the other three. Interesting, isn't it? Just as an exercise to find out how much of this is actually carried over. Well, let's look then at considering this that uh, not all the proving information is there, then what, how, how were the repertories then put together by different people? What are the strategies? Well, the early strategy was, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to describe here to you, and the example repertories then are nerves, gentries, concordance, hempels, and ER. And uh, what they do, in their um, organization is that they do put in uh, the create rubrics with a remedy in each rubric, but they put in details about each remedy in the rubric. So it's usable when there's not too many remedies. Uh, it's rather slow reading, but it's kind of valuable to look at sometimes. And sometimes the remedies sound pretty much alike, so you can't really tell much difference between them. Uh, here's an example, and this is from Hempel's repertory based on Yar's new manual. And the rubric is, up here, integuments, which means external covering of the head, eruptions, and itching. That's the rubric. So in other words, it's the outer surface of the head, and it's eruptions that are itching. So here's how they describe it in the repertory. Here's how they, as an example. They'll have, uh, in the rubric, they'll have Mercurius, and it describes it as having itching eruption in the head. The next remedy is nature mirror. Itching eruption on the hairy border of the nape of the neck, temples, and eyebrows. So you can see how they're making that. They're, they're describing the difference of the remedies within the rubric, which is kind of handy. You can see why they might do that. Then we have the eruption on the head smarts with little itching, phosphorus. Eruption on the forehead with a burning itching sensation, burrito carb. Eruption on the hairy scalp, itching violently, burrito muriaticum, and then small scurfy places on the hairy scalp with itching, calinitricum. Well, as I say, it could be useful for learning. However, if there's a lot of remedies, it's pretty tedious. So here's another strategy. Include as much detail as possible. And that's the method that, that that's being used in synthesis and the complete and repertories like that. Uh, however, the rubrics can become very large, hundreds of remedies. Grading will become insignificant when there's such a number of remedies. And the, the books, if they're actually a book, too heavy to lift, so you have to have multiple volumes. Impossible to do handwritten analysis. And then computer programs will work, but the outcome can be too large for use usefulness. So here's an example in synthesis. Head eruptions itching. 43 remedies. Okay, looks good. And now we'll go to the Berninghausen repertory, which is the one we use for our foundation. You see in Berninghausen, the rubric only has 10 remedies. So we see a much smaller rubric, 10 remedies compared to 43 remedies. So is this simply because the repertory is older with fewer remedies available? Or is a smaller rubric part of a strategy that, that Berninghausen used, followed a, a Boger edited Berninghausen's work, but Berninghausen method? 
And so we're going to look at strategy three, which is the burning hazard method. And that strategy is to keep rubrics relatively small using remedies, remedies that are found to be chosen from clinical experience. So we have the proving information, but then many years of clinical experience confirm which remedies are most useful. And those are the ones that are emphasized in the rubric. The next thing is in doing analysis, the rubric is selected to match the patient's symptom importance. And that would be intensity of the symptom, persistence, strange, rare, or peculiar. And the last thing as well, the analysis emphasis is on location, modalities, and concomitants. So let's talk about modalities and concomitants. Berninghausen found that the use of modalities and concomitants, I abbreviated M plus C, to be an extremely useful method in doing analysis. And starting with the most important symptom that you can pick out of the case, <clears throat> and then you bring in modalities and concomitants if they're available, and they will themselves identify the remedy oftentimes. Burning hasn't also discovered the use of extending these two symptom types to be considered as generals. I'll explain that a little bit more in a moment. The repertory is structured to efficiently apply this method to the analysis. In other words, Berninghausen had a method, a strategy, and that strategy is reflected in how the repertory was constructed and made. The repertory we're going to consider is the one that was edited by Boger. Uh, and he, what Boger did was take uh, Berninghausen's work, uh, the therapeutic pocketbook, as well as additional publications and writings of Berninghausen, put them all together into a, a more complete repertory. So here's an example in Boninghausen repertory. So here is the section of the repertory called heat and fever. Okay. And here are the sections of that, the subsections of that repertory part. Okay. So aggr aggravation, amelioration, concomitants, heat and burning, partial heat and time. That's the way the, the, the section is broken up. Okay. So you see that aggravation and amelioration concomitants are separate parts of that rep, uh, repertory section. Whereas in Kent's and others, you'll find that the aggravation and amelioration are subrubrics under particular symptoms. So the modalities and concomitants are separated out, and but they apply the aggravations and, and ameliorations that are in there apply to all the rubrics that are in this section of the repertory. So any symptom, any rubric that's under heat and burning or under partial heat, you can apply the aggravation, amelioration, and concomitant uh, parts, symptoms, rubrics to it. That's how he generalized it. He found that to be accurate. So let's look here at an animal case example to show you the difference. <clears throat> and this is Moses. He's a five-year-old cat, recently ill, very lethargic, completely lost his appetite. If you make him stand up, he cries out. He has not moved for 24 hours. There is a fever going from 103 and a half Fahrenheit to 105. The blood analysis shows a normal white cell count, normal neutrophil levels, but very low lymphocyte and monocyte numbers. And this suggests there's some migration of cells to an extravascular site. In other words, maybe there's an abscess forming. And these values are additional values are elevated if you're interested in them. <clears throat> okay, so basically what we have is some kind of a condition resulting in an inflammatory fever. And we don't know for sure the cause of it. It suggested possibly we were thinking maybe it was an abscess, maybe a bite or something. So here's an analysis then of the symptoms based on Kent's repertory. So we have inflammatory fever, and under that we have fever motion aggravates, and then we have generals under general section, meat lying ameliorates, and then under mind shrieking, crying out. And we find him then the list of remedies here. We decided on studying materia medica to use bryonia. 
and bryonia was the remedy that cured the cat. It was given as a 30C, a single pellets on a four-hour schedule. The plan was for four doses. I think he responded after two, if I remember right. And the treatment then was sufficient for him to go on to completely full recovery, uh, as confirmed in the follow-up a day or two later. Okay, so that's Kent's repertory. Let's look at synthesis treasure repertory. We do the same thing. We consider fever, inflammatory fever, motion aggravates, lying amelioration, shrieking, the same symptoms. However, now you see we have um, 16 remedies in here to consider. There's a lot of remedies to that have all of these symptoms as compared to seven kents. There's a lot more remedies you need to look at if you're willing to do that. <laughs> okay, lastly, we're going to look at the Berninghausen method. And what we do here is we use fever inflammatory, and then we use uh, a modali modalities and concomitants. And the, when we do that, the very first remedy here is bryonia. It's the only remedy that comes up that has all four. So it's very easy, very strongly indicated. Uh, I do note here uh, rubric three, because it's, it's such a long text, uh, what this means is inclination to lie down during the fever. So uh, that's the meaning of that third one. The, we use a modality, rubric two is modality under fever. It's under the fever section of the repertory. And we have uh, fever, it's in a separate aggravation section. It applies to all the rubrics in the fever part. Uh, fever, worse for motion, 22 remedies. And then we have two concomitants in that section. The one I just pointed out to you, the lying down during fever, and number four, the shrieking and crying out during fever. So you see that the Boninghausen method more clearly and strongly brings up a remedy for consideration. That doesn't necessarily mean that the top remedy is the remedy to choose, but you'll find in using the repertory that it's very often will indicate it that way. It'll be the first one or two or three, maybe. It really is very accurate in bringing up the top remedies for consideration. That's a real advantage of it, especially for animal use. Okay. So the New World Veterinary Repertory, we use the burning house method. We chose that as being the best one that we found in our experience uh, for doing animal cases because very often we don't have the information you have in a human case. The second thing we did using that repertory as a foundation, we took out all of the symptoms in the repertory that you would only recognize in a human. Things like describing sensations, types of pain, things that only verbal communication could give you. Anything you could observe, we left in, of course. And then we took any, any rubrics in there that could be uh, recognized in animals and we enlarged them, mostly from kents. And lastly, we added some rubrics, mostly from kents, that would be particularly helpful for animal cases. So we took out what was not useful to our work to make it simpler to use the repertory. We brought in additional information for Kent and from Boger, mostly the synoptic key, and from ER, from the new manual, as our primary sources. And we also brought in some useful information from other repertories, like from NERS, Borkey, Harry's Guiding Symptoms, and Allen's Encyclopedia. Not very much, but some. A few remedies that we found would be most important for us as rubrics for veterinary use. Okay? So there you have it. That's going rather quickly, I know. You might have questions about it, but that's how we came up with the first veterinary repertory. Thank you, Richard. Thank you so much. And Wendy, you can go ahead and share your screen. I love that cat picture. <laughs> <laughs> How's that looking good? Yeah. And does it change when I change it? Yes, it does. Okay. 
All right. All right, I'll take it away. I wanted to um, add a few pointers that'll help when you're using the repertory to add to Richard's coverage of how we put it together. Um, one is that Kent had a, uh, when we were adding rubrics from Kent, he has a general extremities chapter. And since we didn't, uh, the new world just has posterior, which is the hind legs and anterior, which is the front legs. So we put all the general extremity rubrics from Kent into posterior extremities. Uh, so always check there if you're not finding something. The other thing that we did to make the repertory easier to use and keep your mind on non-human animals is change the terminology. So for example, wrist uh, would be carpus for the animals, um, ankles in the human reps would be uh, hawks for the veterinary term. So things like that. Uh, we also uh, considered um, asterisk the heat period um, to be equivalent to menses in human females. It's not the same uh, as far as the cycle of reproduction, but it is estrus is when a discharge is produced by the body in dogs, not in all species. And so it was considered um, um, by the homeopaths that I've talked to to be equivalent to menses in human females. So look in, under estrus for the heat period any behaviors, any symptoms. We also, uh, one really cool thing that we did, which is what you can do uh, when you, you, you start from the bottom up, we, we added cross-references uh, so that whenever you get to, say, uh, a, a rubric that you really like, but it doesn't seem to have a lot of remedies in it, instead of combining rubrics from different sections that we thought, well, those are kind of the same, we thought we'd maintain that organization that Boninghausen had, that Kent had, and we just put in a cross-reference. So you can find underneath the rubric you're looking at, oh, you can also look under, um, for example, um, under emaciation, the, ne nep of the, the nape of the neck emaciation, then there's a, a cross-reference external throat emaciation. So we have lots of cross-references that were added. We also added some definitions of some of the older terms. So you'll be able to find those, which is nice. And the other thing that we added, we used um, rubrics from Schwartz's wound repertory. You'll find a lot of those under generalities, injuries, or also skin wounds. They come in handy in the veterinary world. That's good to know. So let me just go over the um, organization of the new world. And this, this um, slide shows that you, we start out with the body parts. And often you'll, after the body part, you'll have the function of that body part or the product that is issued from that body part. So for example, after eyes, you'll find vision. A chapter after ears, you'll find hearing and so forth, you know, with the abdomen, the colon, and then you'll find stool. And so it's kind of uh, makes a lot of sense with how you can proceed, how you can find the section that you need. Um, then coryza, you'll find that under the nose chapter and it has its own modalities. And then after those body parts are ended, you find sleep and then chill, fever, perspiration, which kind of makes sense. Perspiration can be issued during a fever. And then after that, skin. And then finally, generalities is there. So those are the chapters. And just a quick note, the see after chill on this slide, I have a semicolon. If you're ever writing down where you need to look for a rubric and you're writing it, but you're not in the program, you can use a semicolon to indicate that the next word is a different section. So that's just really handy. If you use just a comma, that means it's part of the same line. So chill semicolon means up, oh, we're going to a different section after that. So within each chapter of the anatomical body part 
it, the, the chapters are organized in this way. The beginning, I, I have here location. That just means where in, say, in the, in the female um, genitalia, for example, where are we? Where is the symptom? And I've started, we started externally and then working your way in, into the body. So it's not alphabetical necessarily, it's anatomical the location section at the very head of the chapter. Um, then modalities comes after location. So as you, as you remember, Boninghausen had a lot of symptoms that maybe, even if you have an odd symptom that keeps recurring in the same place, that's where you'll use the location rubrics. So following those location rubrics, those are the modalities that have to do with that section of the body. Like Richard was saying, like Dr. Picken was saying, um, the aggravations, the ameliorations that have to do with, say, the respiration, or say, the nose, or say, the ears. And part of the modalities also is time. So time occurs, and then aggravation, and then amelioration. Following that, in the chapter, you'll have concomitants, all the symptoms that occur at the same time, you know, when you're experiencing, say, a, a fever, and then you're also seeing a cough whenever they get a fever, that cough will be found under the concomitant section of fever. So you have those sections beginning each chapter, not, not each chapter, they don't all have these sections, but this is where they'll be location, modalities, and then concomitants, and then the rest of the chapter, which is basically all the symptoms. So that's how each chapter is organized. Now, like Dr. Pickern said, the Boninghausen's cornerstone were modalities, and they're really helpful uh, when working with animal symptoms because we don't have a lot of the information that humans can give us when we're sharing our story to each other. We have to look at their behavior. We have to look at their body language. We have to look at, um, do they not want to go outside today? What is it about today that's different? You know, it's, is it weather? Is it something they did yesterday? that they don't want to do again. So you're looking a lot for the modalities that can really differentiate the remedies for you. And now where will we find them in the new world? You'll find them at the head of the chapter. Remember I talked about the modalities being right after location. So there's time, time modalities, you know, what time of day are things better or worse? And then there's aggravations and there's ameliorations. They can be at the head of each chapter. And then within the chapter, you can have a big section, like for example, I wrote down appetite, urination. Those are sections within other chapters. You can even have modalities for those specific things. Another section, say within nose is coryza, the running nose is stuffiness. You can have modalities for that specific symptom. So that's within the chapter. Just look at the head of each section for more modalities that are even more specific to that particular symptom. And then the big section for modalities in the new world is in the generalities chapter. And it's interesting, you start generalities chapter with bones and glands, it's like a location, but only you can't put the glands and the bones in one body part. So they're put in the generalities chapter. And that's where you find the modalities, it's, it's a really big, big section. So I'll do a little case. This is Cleo. She's a cross between a Boston Terrier and a French Bulldog, pretty much adorable plus adorable. And she's a spayed female. At the time I worked with, I, I worked with her, began work with her. She was four months old. She's a, I'm not sure if she rescue or not. She could have been one of those designer dogs where they take two, two breeds together, but that's Cleo. And she presented, um, well, first I'll talk about her timeline. Just, you don't have to take all this in. It's just an example of what we're doing. And, and I did plenty of this before I found homeopathy. So, so July here in the beginning, it's funny, I want to point to my slide and I can't in the webinar. Um, she's born July 20th, 2012. And couple months later, a few weeks later, distemper, hepatitis, parvo, para, influenza vaccine was given again two weeks later, the same thing, distemper, hepatitis, para, influenza, parvo, and then also Bordetella or kennel cough. 
In the beginning of October, she was given distemper, hepatitis, parainfluenza, part again, and rabies, and vectra. It's a uh, for the fleas and ticks and panicure. She probably had roundworms, and then she was spayed. So it was all on the same day. And then a few days later, she came to her new home after being blasted by all this stuff. Ten days later, up oh, she needs a Lyme vaccine and a lepto vaccine. Another month later, DHPP again, another lepto, another Lyme. And then by then she needed a little help. So they gave her Fortiflora to help repopulate her bowels with the right organisms. And metronide is all to stop what was starting to have, she was starting to have problems with diarrhea. So after that, they called me and I just show you what our animals are dealing with. You know, there's a lot of vaccines here. It's a, it's a quite an insult and hopefully we can teach everybody to move, start moving away from these things. So she, by the time she came to see me, these are her symptoms. Her diarrhea was pretty watery. And I did write after vaccination. I almost could put that in almost every case that I see. Not necessarily that it's right after vaccination, but they've all been vaccinated. It's very rare I have animals that aren't. And the ones that aren't are easier to treat. And I can say that after 20, 20, 30 years, I've seen that. Uh, she also had a straining and the diarrhea was explosive and it was worse. She was worse. The diarrhea was worse both after uh, exertion. And she wanted to go out for long walks, but they blew her away. Uh, she had poor growth. She looked very bulldoggy, which in retrospect, it's more clear than at the time, but very heavy duty shoulders and very lightweight, weakish hindquarters. She also had retained deciduous teeth. Those are those that drop out, that are supposed to drop out. By then, they were still in there. Um, she was also, she had a lot of odor to her, but she hated being bathed. It would turn her into a different dog. She'd be very withdrawn, very quiet, trembling. It was, again, looking for the aggravation, the ameliorations in our animals. That was a definite aggravation for her in general. Um, so when I asked, the day I came over, uh, the very first time I met her, she'd had a wonderful long walk that she had a, a, a great time on. See, that would have been, uh, it was still hot. And she was pale and listless and this was a normally very bouncy pup and she was drooling like she might have been um might have been sick to her stomach or nauseous and so it was really clear that what had just happened was an aggravation for her you know the exertion maybe the weather the heat but that was the key to her case seeing her after that even though it's not like they dragged her around she really wanted to go out she liked the walk so it wasn't the exertion uh, that that she was really upset about but it really blew her away so in other words it affected her physically it's not just that oh no i was just made to do something i hated she was really blown away by this experience so an aggravation so normally uh presenting a case i'd go into all the materia medica but we are looking at the radar opus and how nice and easy it is to use it in the program so here it is when you've done all your homework and you've figured out which symptoms are the best here's the chart that you can get so the first uh, rubric there is under the generalities just like i was talking about with aggravation at the head of the chapter and you're looking for exertion physical perfectly fit her symptom what made it what made her worse what blew her away it wasn't just that one time when i saw her too it was a pattern but also bring out the, the diarrhea more her her digestive system would be out of whack so her the description of her diarrhea it was gushing it was forcible and i used both of those nowadays you know how you change as you uh become more experienced as a homeopath so i probably would have picked one or the other I wouldn't have had so many, you know, two of them about the almost the same thing. No, I shouldn't say same thing. So gushing forcible. And then the next one was stool before. That just means um, before the stool arrives, they're straining. Tenismus is straining. And the fourth rubric is applied to her overall, that she was very well muscled in the front, but weak and not so great in the back. And she had re the retained teeth that should have been 
uh, starting to drop out by then. It's very common for both of her breeds. And then also that she was smelly. So I, I use perspiration odorous. It's, we left it in there because perspiration, you might not see a sweating dog, but of course you'll see other species sweating. So you can use that, the horse. Um, but another thing I've written across the top, another rubric you can use instead is under generalities, offensiveness, fetter, and of body. So that's another good one. And if you had looked and found perspiration odorous, you'd find the cross-reference leading to the other rubric that you could also use. And sulfur was a two there, a second grade. So down in the chart, you can see the grading. Uh, the four is the highest grade, working down to one. And the only remedy that seemed to cover all her symptoms was sulfur. And maybe you were all thinking of that because I was focusing so much on how much the heat impacted her, which is a big deal for sulfur, that they really have trouble with heat. But it was kind of interesting. I could probably put in here about how her, she didn't like baths. You'd probably find that in there and sulfur would probably rank pretty high. So I did give her sulfur. And that would have been in December, 2012. I gave her a 30 C. I could have used a higher potency, um, but it was striking how much, how sick she would get when she wasn't doing well. And so I did rate her as a vital force, not that strong, not that great. So I didn't want to push things too hard. And I had people that were really going to follow up with me when necessary. So I didn't need to rush into anything. I'm a very cautious prescriber. So 30C. A week later, she was described as having too much energy. They were kind of mad. <laughs> but was, what was really interesting is I should have make it, made a circle around those paws, but her hind paws, they were bigger. It was, it was really just in one week. So something was already happening. She was trying to catch up. So I did repeat. Uh, the, as far as the diarrhea went, it kept on and off, on and off, on and off. She was overall feeling better, but her GI tract was still not great. Uh, so we went up to 200 C at the end of January. And a comment um, a few days later was that she was more trainable. She had less accidents in the house and she had more foreign stools. So it wasn't a dramatic, ta-da, you know, normal stools, but her overall improvement was remarkable. She was able to listen instead of being this crazy bouncing off the wall or completely knocked out from the heat. You know, she had an in-between now. And by April, she had 70% normal stools. So it was a good start. You know, waiting, we're letting it grow. We're avoiding any more vaccines. And then up comes the next issue. And it, it's really interesting. I consider neck pain is something in practice I used to see in the older animals. But boy, she started in with it pretty severely in November. And so, of course, since she was doing so well, sulfur had brought her, in, even in her uh, general symptoms improvement, I went back to sulfur. Um, it did seem to help with that pain, but that's when you step back. And you look and you say, wait a minute, the diary is going up and down. Now this pain, you know, in spite of increasing doses. So, of course, I had to re repertorize and you know, see where, where we needed to go from there. As you can see, the, the, the pain and the diarrhea were still there. Even though she was now fully muscled and was able to do nice walks, she no longer had the collapsing in the heat. So here's another repertorization. Um, the diarrhea tended to be at night, so it's a, it would be a, in a time modality for that symptom. And the, the second symptom, she also would have uh, times where she wasn't getting anything out. So it was interesting that after the sulfur and giving her time to respond, she had more uh, specific ways of presenting her symptoms. So she was healthier. Her vital force had improved, even though the sulfur was not curative. It was helping. It was pushing her in the right direction. So she had lots more of that tenesmus, ineffectual urging and straining. She was still a smelly dog, though. That hadn't changed. And then we did notice that her eyes would be watering in the cold. So now we're in a different season. Um, that, that also makes it hard when you're judging uh, how animals are doing in the heat. Then you change seasons. 
And so I might have seen, well, I wonder if she would have been worse in the heat still with not doing as well on the sulfur. But now we're in the winter, so I can't tell. But her eyes did water in the cold, so I added that in. Uh, eyes aggravation, again, that modality at the head of the chapter. And then teeth, dentition slow and difficult. That's referring to her baby teeth still being present. And then under generalities, it described how she was with that um, reaction to heat. And I did go back in the case to use that uh, because sulfur was not curative. So I need to look at the whole case, you know, everything taking into account. And then the reason the chest axilla was in there was that that was where the pain seemed to hurt the worst. And they'd pick her up under her, uh, under her chest. That's when she would yike. I considered it to probably be referred pain from her neck, but that's where I use because that's where it seemed to be localized best we could see without doing a lot of diagnostics. And there's two remedies that came up at the top. You can see there silica and HEPAR. Both had covered all of the rubrics. Sulfur was still pretty high, um, but it didn't have that her eyes would water in the cold. And the reason, oh, I see, I see how you use just general eyes aggravation instead of I didn't have to use eyes watering because there isn't eyes watering aggravated cold. It just means that the eyes in general, the symptoms are occurring. Uh, just like Dr. Pickham said, the symptoms in that rest of the chapter are worse with the cold. So the aggravation applies to the eyes in general. And in her case, it was it was watering. So I, I studied Cilicia, I studied HEPAR. I uh, looked at phosphorus mark just to, to see what her symptoms looked like in those. And I, I ended up with silica. It is at the top, but it's not an automatic choice just because it's there. So she got a 200C. And it was different than giving the sulfur. It was just like, yep, she's doing good. So see how many years there are in between <laughs> giving the remedy and doing very well. They didn't call me. I saw see her around the neighborhood, uh, checked up, and she's fine. So that's what she needed to follow up the sulfur. And I recently bumped into her again. It was just hilarious be, thinking about that neck pain that was so scary. Um, and she, I'm not sure I've ever seen this before, but she would, as I'm talking and chatting outside, we're in a sloped area. She would go get an acorn from one part of the yard, put it, no, no, it wasn't an acorn, it was her ball. She put it at the top of the slope and she'd let it go and she'd watch it roll away and then she'd run and she'd grab it and then she'd pick it back up to the slope. So she was entertaining herself. I, I'm not sure I've ever seen a little dog doing that, especially one that was bouncing off the wall before and wouldn't leave you alone. And then she she lay on her back and she kind of wiggled all over in in the grass. So to me, that's a, that's a very much a pain-free dog. She's doing very well. So I was really happy with how Cleo turned out. And I think that's all I have. So to turn it back over to, to our, our moderator, or if you guys have any questions. Thank you so much, Wendy, or Dr. Jensen. Thank you. So, do you guys have any questions for Dr. Pitcairn or Dr. Jensen about the repertory or anything like that? Okay, do you not use mind symptoms? That is a question. And Dr. Jensen, I know that you use a lot of mental symptoms, right, when you're taking a case. I do. We we were very careful in what we included in the mind section because it, it doesn't mean that if you see it there, you must be able to see it in your animal. It means that it's possible to see that symptom. It is possible. And depending upon the animal and the relationship you have with the animal, you can use some mind symptoms. Just be sure they're not too detailed, you know, and you're not assuming something. You can say anxiety, you can see fear, you can see jealousy. You know, make it, use broad brush strokes, but they can really help with your case. Okay, that makes sense. Are there diseases and wounds in the general's chapter or anywhere else? Um, diseases and wounds? What was that? 
are there diseases and wounds in the general's chapter or anywhere else? I actually wrote down in case this was asked, the wounds that we took are in generalities under injuries, the wound repertories, and also look under skin wounds. And you'll also see the cross references. Um, diseases, not so much. Uh, Dr. Pickett and I don't think we, we kind of took out labels because that's a problem. Yeah, we didn't really have enough confidence to do that. Okay, and yes, Jennifer, playback um, will be possible. We are recording this webinar for you. Okay, and I will post it to the Radar Opus Training Academy. Any, any more questions specific to, oh, there's a lot of questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, some, there, there actually were a couple questions about loquacity. Um, do you guys have any insight as to where that would be in the rubric? Or, yes. I, I couldn't hear it there. Say it again. Loquacity. Oh, loquacity. Um, yeah. I what responded would that to that. End? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think there was another question. So let's, lo, okay. So loquacity, shrieking, howling, whimpering, lamenting, groaning, complaining, bellowing. So, you, so what I find helpful is I usually go to synonym.com or thesaurus.com and try to get other words that I can search for. So I, think that, I think this kind of relates to what we were just talking about there, the use of mental symptoms. You see that when, when Wendy and I had to decide whether to put that in, loquacity, then you have to ask yourself, well, what does that mean? Well, we think of it as a human trait, and at least the way I think of it. Talk, 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 yeah. Yeah, somebody will come and they just start talking about themselves. <laughs> but do dogs and cats and other animals do that? I, I don't get that sense, you know. I, I think if they're making a lot of sound, they're doing it because of some need they have or some emotion they feel or something. I don't get a sense that they're like, that they have egos like we do, you know, and they're going to say, they're going to go on and on for half an hour and then say to us, well, enough about me. What do you think of me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you say, Wendy? Yeah, you, you'd want to look for why are they talking so much? Yeah. You know, then that's going to be what you, you're looking for. But also under larynx and trachea, there's vo voice and vocalization. So there's things about yes. the voice. Yes, making section. sounds, certainly. But but you can see that the, the challenge for all of us is that we tend to extrapolate onto animals what we think uh, they are based on our experience. But we don't really fully understand the animal experience, you know. It's a little different. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, there is a question that I received earlier via email. And um, the question was, do you guys foresee adding new um, rubrics to your vet veterinary or changing it in any way in the future? Kind of like an add-on or additions of any kind? This is already the second edition. Um, I, I hadn't planned. I'm, 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 I don't want to say anything. What do you think, Dr. Baker? <laughs> I think that... that the possibilities that come to my mind is, first of all, we could add in some remedies that we've decided are important. Like, for instance, the no-sod listen. That's not in there, really. And that might be really helpful to put that in uh, some of the rubrics. Um, as just an example. There might be a couple of other remedies like that that we might want to put in. Another angle on that is, and we've, we've, and we've put this out to people at meetings and in other ways. We would like to uh, either add remedies or rubrics or change the grade of a remedy, of a remedy in a rubric based on the reports from the veterinarians using this repertory, uh, giving us their cured cases. Because then if we have enough confirmation, we can say, 
we should add this in or we should emphasize this remedy, right? Unfortunately, we haven't had much of that coming to us. But I can see the possibility would be that if we were working together, um, we veterinarians or others using it for animal work could bring to us reports of cured cases that were, you know, clearly cured, not just assume so. Be that could be helpful information. We could really modify the repertory, but that would take, that would be a real group effort. We haven't got that in place yet at this point. Okay. Yeah, that would be a really, really great group effort. Mm -hmm. Many minds are better than just two minds putting it together. Yes, and I, and I think, uh, I, I think I can speak for Wendy that we have a high standard in that regard. And we're not going to add anything in until we have real confidence in it. And by confidence, I mean we would want to see a case where it was clearly cured. Maybe more than one. Maybe we need two or three cases that are cured. Um, unfortunately, the way a lot of repertories are being added to, it's not quite that standard. You know, they're just whatever somebody thinks is helpful in the case. And I don't trust that myself. Wendy, what do you say about it? Yeah, I think we'd have to be very cautious because it's so easy to be led astray mm -hmm. by wow this was great because just like um uh, remember with the sulfur with cleo i wouldn't want to put her symptoms down under sulfur for yay cure case because she really mm -hmm. needed silica now mm -hmm. whether she needed them in order it's it's very possible i think sulfur is very helpful but you don't want to put sulfur down and all of right. that information. You, yeah. So. Yeah, and you can easily you can easily see that if you hadn't followed with the other remedy, and you just assumed it was cured, you could right. put information that wasn't helpful. So that's the that's the, the challenge to all of us, and that's why we feel like we want to have a really good standard. Yeah, and um, Dr. Pitt, Karen, and Dr. Jensen, there are a lot of. Um, specific questions that I received specifically about a case. Do you guys have resources where people can find veterinary homeopaths? Um, you know, if they have questions, if they're using your repertory, but they're not getting anywhere, maybe they need additional help. Do you have resources for people? Yep. Yes. Shall I start, mm -hmm. Wendy? Yeah, you should. It's your, it's your website. Yeah. Well, there's two websites. Uh, I have, I, on mine, I have, if you go to my website, which is drpitcairn.com, it's drpitcairn, as one word, dot com. Um, there is a menu item. I think it says referrals, if I remember right, <laughs> but it'll be obvious. And you can go down uh, by clicking on that. You can come down to a, 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 a sub menu item there that you open up and you can search for veterinarians that have been trained in homeopathy by us according to the state or country. So it's very helpful. I mean, I know it's not thousands, it's hundreds, but, or not even probably. We've had about 500 veterinarians go through our training program. Um, and which is significant, but not, you know, it's not thousands of them. So it's somewhat limited, but unfortunately, those willing to be listed for referral on my website might be more like 150 or so because they're busy with their practices. But anyway, it's a good source to go in there and look. Um, the other site, which is duplicating that information and really taking it over, is the, um, the site for our training program for veterinarians. It's the Pitcairn Institute of Veterinary Homeopathy. Um, a little embarrassing to put my name on it, but that's what they wanted to do. Uh, so it's, PIVH.org, PIVH.org. And when you go there in the same way, you can find a listing of veterinarians that are willing to, to consult with you. So use the either site. And I say it's taking it over in the sense that, you know, as I get older and retiring from practice and probably eventually from teaching, that'll be the primary site that carries us on. PIVH.org. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. And those are really great resources. I put those websites in the comment section for you. Good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. And then, um, Wendy, this is a question for you about the case with Cleo. Um, 
okay, did you give the Celica the first time after the episode of the intense neck pain? No, first I tried sulfur again. Okay, so first you tried sulfur and then the Celica is what it you tried. It seemed to help a little, but yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. Okay. Any other questions um, for Dr. Karen or Dr. Jensen? Uh, yes, we will record this webinar and I will post it. And I just want to remind you all again that um, the New World Veterinary Homeopathy is on sale until the end of the month. So if you are interested in purchasing, now would be a really good time to do so. Also, if I can add, uh, not to undercut your message there, but yeah. it is also available in the book form. Perfect. Yes. And yeah. yes, Dr. Pitcairn, where can they get it in a book form? Oh, Garcia, what is that? I, don't, I can never repronounce them. It's that. Uh, um, oh, Nariana. 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 Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, they're a great company. I yeah, think they I are. spelled it right. Um, I, w I buy a lot of my homeopathy books from them. I can hold the book up here. Okay. It's a German, it's a German edition, too. There's a German edition as well. Okay, great. Perfect. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Pitcairn. Yeah, so it's a pretty significant book. You know, it's, it's a full, almost a, as big a repertory as Kent and Brunehausen. Not quite, but because we pared down in some of the rubrics. But still, it's very nicely printed. Very high yeah. quality. Yeah. Perfect. But of course, the computer one is easier to use. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the, it, they both have their pros and cons. It's nice to yeah. have a book, but it's nice to be able to search and repertorize. Yeah, you know? it is. It's a, yeah. I like I still use books too. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, well, thank you all so much. I know that there's a lot of specific questions about specific cases, um, but if you want to seek out a veterinary homeopath that can take your whole case, right? Because we spend at least an hour or two, at least I do with patients. <laughs> um, that would be a lot better to, you know, instead of asking like, what remedy should I use? You know? Well, I might just add to that, that, um, you know, I've been doing this a long time. And of course you, hopefully you get skillful as you go along. <laughs> but I, I find I got to the point where using this method we're talking about, using the Berninghausen method. And uh, even before we had this veterinary repertory, I got it down to where I could work a lot of cases, even chronic ones, half an hour. You know, uh, I did a lot of phone work. Uh, sometimes an email and then I'd work it up and send it back to them. Sometimes it was longer, but you know, you get to where you, you've, you've you know, using this method of, of emphasizing the uh, modalities and concomitants is surprisingly useful. Bernie Berninghausen was so brilliant. I mean, could, and he lived at the time of Holloman, and yet he picked it up, and he just really, he really worked it in such a way that's been very useful to us. Wonderful, wonderful method. <laughs> you didn't have to spend the first fifteen minutes trying to find the right rubric within all the human terminology. No, no. Uh -uh. In fact, he did the first repertories, didn't he? But I think I think Hahnemann tried to start one with uh, maybe it was with Yar, but it didn't come to fruition. But then Berninghausen came in and actually I think his first one was the repertoire of the antisorix. And Hahnemann liked it. 1836 or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Great. Well, thank you both. We really appreciate your time. Thank you everybody for joining. You're getting a lot of thank yous. Dr. Pitcairn and Dr. Jensen. Uh -huh. And well, thanks for hosting it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And um, like I said, this webinar will be posted under the Training Academy website where I post all of the webinars that we have. Um, so thank you all so much. And we'll see you for the next webinar. Okay. All right. Okay. okay thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.